Earlier this year, I was walking with my son to school. He's four years old. We were enjoying the day, and all of a sudden he said, Daddy, where's Earth? I can't find it anywhere. So I wanted him to think about it a little bit. So I said, well, bud, where do you think? He said, I don't know. That's why I'm asking you. So I gave him a little bit of a lead and I said, um, you're looking at it. And he said, well, what do you mean? You mean like the sidewalk and this road? I said, yeah. And that house over there that's on top of it and the dirt and those trees growing out of that park over there. And he thought about it for a little bit. And then he started jumping up and down with excitement saying, I'm jumping on the earth. Something he couldn't grasp or find immediately became readily apparent that the very thing he was looking for was right in front of him. When we lose our way in life, we become dysregulated emotionally. We can become frustrated, anxious, or even apathetic. And eventually we can feel that we're even losing our sense of purpose or goals in life. So what is it that causes us to lose our way or to feel stuck in life? In my work at Tell Counseling, we're often working with clients who come in to see us around two key themes. One is the relationships that they're experiencing with others and also their sense of purpose and their goals in life. But at the core, we find that if someone is struggling in their relationships, that it really impacts their stability in everyday life. And then what we start to see is symptoms of anxiety, depression, or unresolved trauma that comes up. So the importance of the relationship is so significant, and when those aren't going so smoothly, it can really impact someone's well-being on a day-to-day -day basis. So we're not just focusing on a diagnosis, we're really getting into our client's world and understanding their relationships and their experiences in them, and then how this impacts their sense of self-worth or their sense of value in life. Unfortunately, we've got a long way to go in Japan to reduce stigma around mental health, but it's a conversation we all should be having as a result of this pandemic, and it gives us the opportunity to start exploring these avenues and giving people the support that they really need. And when my son seemed to lose his way and couldn't find what he was after, he became impatient and distressed. Luckily, he had me there to help him work through that perplexing issue. But unfortunately, the issues in life that we have are a little bit more intertwined and complicated than that. This pandemic has been hard on many of us, if not all of us. If we look at the impact that it's had on us, many people are experiencing stress and anxiety at higher levels than what we've seen before. I think it's important that we allow ourselves to grieve what we've lost during this time. And that shows that we could use this pandemic as an eclipse in time that's an opportunity for us to take inventory of what we have lost and learn how to rebuild ourselves as we move forward. While there are certainly aspects of life that were really challenging before the pandemic, now we've really lost our sense of comfort and security in what we felt was normal. I think of the many who have lost jobs or their jobs became more demanding and stressful. I think of the families that um, were forced to work at home and kids attending school from home and families being on top of each other and having to work through those new relational dynamics. We also saw suicides increase in 2020 for the first time in over a decade. And we know that out of that group, the most vulnerable from that population were women and youth. I had a family come in to see me for counseling right after the pandemic began and we went through the state of emergency last year. One individual who I will disguise their information and change some of the facts so as not to disclose their identity uh, came in with her parents and uh, she had been truant from school for about the past month. She also had her best friend relocate to the U.S and she was really struggling to get back into school as things got going again. For her, she was experiencing a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress, and while her mind told her, I have to get back into school, her body just shut down. Through the process of being able to come in, talk about her struggles and her problems, and also to see her parents release their sense of fear or anxiety over getting her back into school, they were also more empathetic and supportive. 
After she opened up a little bit in session, she disclosed that when she lost her best friend, she felt that that sense of significance and attachment had, had gone away. And it was really difficult for her to put herself in front of her peers and also her teachers. But with the support of her parents and also a little bit of support from her teachers and friends at school, my client took that huge risk to get herself back into school and, and, and even now with those connections that she has at school and that experience of being able to make sense of what she lost was really significant for her and it just shows how important our relationships are. A well-known psychologist from the 1970s, Mary Ainsworth, advanced what we know about attachment in our relationships, particularly between a caregiver and an infant. She conducted a number of experiments with a mother and an infant in a room where the child, once familiar with their surroundings, would eventually begin to play and explore in the room. Every now and again, looking back to ensure that their mother was within reach. If the child saw that their mother was still present in the room, they continued to explore and play with the toys. If the mother were to leave, or if a stranger came into the room, that sense of safety to play and explore immediately ended. We learned from Ainsworth's research that a child's ability to go out and play while feeling that safe base with their parent also applies to us in our adult relationships. When we have someone that's right there with us and can support us, we feel a sense of stability. But not only that, it also allows us to go out into the world and do what we're created and made to do. But without that sense of secure base or attachment, it's easy for us to become dysregulated and lose our way. Maybe think about your situation. You have a family member, a partner, a friend, or even a coworker, someone that you connect with that when you have that opportunity to meet with them, maybe sit down for a cup of coffee, you really feel encouraged. Maybe you can even encourage them in return. And then it allows you to go away feeling strengthened and revived. This pandemic has altered the playground that we used to feel safe to roam and explore. Now we have different circumstances and situations. Our anxiety levels are different. Our stress levels are different. And this has put a lot of stress and emphasis on families and individuals. Our attachment to those that are close to us is essentially the foundation for our existence. It gives us that security and that sense of feeling seen and heard and known. But when that's taken away from us, we really struggle. That's why I think it's important for us to look at what we've lost during this time and have the opportunity to grieve that. If we can properly understand what it is that we've lost and be able to discuss those things and work through those things with people in our lives that we trust, it'll allow us to integrate that into our experience to be able to move forward and move ahead. Albert Einstein once said that the only source of knowledge is experience. And if knowledge is power, then maybe the attempt is to not let those tragic or traumatic experiences get the best of you, but see if you can overcome that through allowing yourself to grieve that loss in the company of a relationship with somebody to discuss those significant things, to overcome it, come out of it, and then use that experience not only to improve yourself, but also to stand in the gap for a friend, family member, or someone that you know needs help. You've had that experience, you've gone through that yourself, and now you're able to use that as a tool to support other people in your life. I believe this is the redemptive quality that going through a negative experience gives us, that we can turn that into something good at some point down the road. When we face a really difficult trial, there are a number of things that might help us come out of it, but in my mind, it's usually somebody that helps us get through that experience. And so you might ask, you know, what is talking to someone going to do to help me with my problems? Well, let's turn to the field that I'm in. There's a lot of clinical research about what makes counseling or psychotherapy useful or helpful for people. And interestingly, one of the leading outcome studies shows that it's not the technique or the approach of the therapist per se, but it's primarily about the connection that the individual feels with their counselor. So that's really interesting to me because that tells me something. It tells me that it must be that the person feels a sense of security, safety, 
they feel seen, or they feel heard in their counseling session, that really allows them to risk opening up about their problems and getting support and help along the way. This is why recognizing the loss with others is so important. And we can't manage to do that if we're not breaking down the walls of stigma around mental health. Just think, what would help you to feel brave enough to open up about your problems to someone? Well, first of all, you would need someone who's willing to sit and listen with you. And they're not going to be quick to judge and they'll be patient. And when you're able to manage this, you can find that through expressing your experiences, you can start to make meaning of them quite a bit easier. While this pandemic has had many impacts on us that we will never forget, I think we can look at this situation as two sides of the same coin. On one hand, we went through a lot of suffering and loss as a group, as a people, as a society, but also we can take this and integrate it into our experience, use it down the road, become better, become sharper, become closer. And I think this is an opportunity for us to really draw focus on mental health and help to shatter the stigma in Japan and throughout our world. So you might be wondering, this all sounds great, but what can I do to practically work towards this? Well, that certainly depends on your circumstances and your situation, but here are a few things that might help. As best you can, remain curious and open. My son got discouraged along the way, but he had a passion, he had an interest to find what he was after. And by remaining curious about his experience, he was able to find what he was looking for. As best you can, rather than assuming things are going to go a certain way, try to stay flexible and curious and open to each new day that comes along. Can you allow yourself some time to grieve what you've lost or what's been taken from you? Perhaps today you're looking at this for the first time and thinking about, oh, maybe I am grieving something. If we don't settle that grief or work through that, we have the tendency for resentment, frustration, irritability to build up, and that just keeps us stuck. To be able to get unstuck, we've got to look at what it is that impacted us and make sense of that and then find a path forward to be able to work through it. And for those of us that are holding it together quite well, we've gotten through this pandemic and we've been okay, use this as a time not to feel just survivor's guilt, but actually to stand in the gap and be able to support someone around you. Just think of someone at home, at work, in your school, or in your circle of friends that you can reach out to. Let them know that you see them, that you're there for them, or just invite them out for a coffee. Give yourself the opportunity to be available for people who really need you and really need someone during this time. And I'd say be careful about comparison. It's quite natural for us to compare ourselves to the people around us so that we make sure that we're staying on track or staying up, but also to check to make sure we feel valued or that we're accepted by others. But essentially, when you compare yourself to someone else, you take away your own value and your sense of self-worth. So instead of doing that, it might be more helpful to look at who you were the day before and see if you can improve yourself, sharpen yourself, or make yourself better today. Start with a small goal, but make it specific, and just try to accomplish that each day and see if you get anywhere, see if you can make some progress. You'll have days where you have setbacks, but that's okay. You get to wake up the next day and go at it again. Next, Take a risk and reach out to someone if you're struggling. I say risk because it takes an awful lot of courage and bravery to reach out to someone, let them know that you're struggling, and then to be vulnerable about sharing what you've gone through. And if you feel like you don't have anyone that you can reach out to, our lifeline is specifically trained to support people in need. Please reach out to us if you're feeling alone, vulnerable, or you're in a crisis. We're here to help. Similar to what my son was going through that day, when we feel stuck, isolated, or lost, it's really difficult to manage alone. But if we're able to take these losses and integrate them into our overall experience in our life, and especially in our relationships, it shows us that we have the courage to continue on the next day, to continue on tomorrow. And who knows, you might discover that someone out there needs you too. Thank you.